full call uh, the meeting to order for the ad hoc meeting to protect children. Uh, this is our second meeting after we have uh, paused for two over the summer uh, to come back together. Uh, so before we get started, uh, uh, Dr. Quick, do you mind uh, saying the lesson? All right. Oh, thank you <clears throat> for every opportunity we have to serve you. Those we serve in our community, as well as for you. Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. Uh, so. <coughs> Everybody has been sent a copy of the minutes from our meeting in April, uh, and we've got hard copies as well, so that everybody can have that. And just just before we get to the approval minutes, I, I don't know, uh, Bob's. We have received a message from uh, Miss Hyde. Uh, Miss Hyde has has a broken her femur over the summer, and uh, so we were not expecting her tonight. We're kind of hopeful she would be here. She, she, she is uh, recovering. She started being able to drive again, so I was not sure at first whether she was going to be able to be here. Uh, Alan had confirmed that she was not, but just uh, for everybody, just please keep uh, Ms. Hyde in your prayers uh, for recovery and, and some healing there. So just wanted to mention that. Uh, all right, for the purposes of the minutes, I hope everybody's had an opportunity to take a look at those. Um, it's just, we went over uh, the things that were in initial discussion. Uh, do I have, is there a motion to approve the minutes from the meeting of April the 30th? So moved. All right. All right. So motion is made by Logan and then seconded uh, by both Dr. Clay and Dr. And so that, so all in favor of the minutes. All right, so any opposition? All right, so minutes have been approved. Um, we'll call for recognition of the public, although there's nobody here other than the people on the committee and then uh, Master Hickey, who's helping take the minutes for tonight's meeting, so uh, there's nobody that's up here. So we also have the agenda for this evening uh, for the new business as well. And uh, is there any? Uh, is there a motion to approve this evening's agenda? To move. Okay. I have a, a motion made and a second. second. All right. Motion and second has been made. All in favor of approval of the agenda for the night? Uh, All right. Okay. Any opposed? All right. In the past. Uh, so there's a lot of stuff here, and, and we're going to <laughs> sort of talk about it in a little bit. I don't expect tonight's meeting to last terribly long because I want you all to be able to have an opportunity to have the better understanding of the data uh, that we brought up. But I wanted to sort of back up talk first. I want to sort of go down uh, about some things that we're looking at. Uh, I'll have Alan talk about the sequential intercept model if nobody minds. I'm planning on talking about sort of a legislative update about some things that are going on, uh, both obviously with the legislature and things that we're seeing as impacting the court. Uh, and then we'll sort of talk about where we want to go so, Becca, if you don't mind talking about some of the data we're seeing out of DPS. So, I've provided the initial data back to the first service and pulled it up. And then I also have some updated data just specific to sexual abuse, but I will pass it around. And this is going to be case specific, so it's not going to, you'll see a little difference in numbers um, on the sexual abuse allegations. But basically, um, our state keeps system called state measures and that's how we are able to gather all of our data. So anything that the Department of Social Services has as far as as far as referrals, um, allegations, classification, which is how we yeah in data cases like all of that is kept in our system. Um, and so we are able to thankfully keep up with data pretty well. I am trying to find the DCS for this page here. So in 2023 alone, um, I have labeled just the amount of cases that we got um, just for Summer County. So in 2023, we had a grand total of 1,475 uh, referrals that were called in and worked by CCS here in Summer County. Um, 
And then if you look down case by allegations in 2023, it'll break it down as to all the different types of allegations that we work um, with. <coughs> excuse me, the highest total of cases being drug exposed child, with 753 of those worked in 2023. Um, and then you can see that grand total, well, they kind of break it down, lack of supervision, um, and then the next total being environmental, I'm sorry, yeah, environmental neglect and physical abuse, and then we have a lot of domestic violence cases, um, as well as sexual abuse cases. So, in 2023 alone, also, Judge had asked if I can pull just our data based on our sexual abuse allegations, um, just to kind of look at that. Um, so, in 2023, we had a total of 270 cases, not just necessarily allegations, but cases, uh, with, with at least one allegation of sexual abuse. Of those cases, we had 55 that were classified as substantiated, meaning we had enough to say what the child said happened. Um, and so we feel that this person who's listed as a perpetrator needs to be listed in our system as substantiated for sexual abuse. Uh, the next one, and let me just kind of read it a little, uh, were classified different ways. Um, there was also 40s in 2023 that were classified as either child with sexual behavior problems or unable to complete. So sex with, child with sexual behavior problems, um, those cases are concerning to me just because that's a child that is 12 and under who is showing significant concerns just acting out sexually towards another child or peer. Could be a family member, could be a classmate. Um, and we don't substantiate children under the age of 13, so their classification is going to always be listed as child with sexual behavior problems. So, sexually reactive? Correct. Yes, yeah. back in the old days it was sexually reactive. Now our classification is child with sexual behavior problems. Thus far in 2024, as of June 30th, we have had 106 cases with at least one allegation of sexual abuse. Of those cases, 24 have been classified as substantiated, uh, 53 have been classified as unsubstantiated, and there's 22 that were closed with child with sexual behavior problems. So that kind of gives you just a scope of what is going on in our county with our children. Um, like I said, I, I think I mentioned in the last meeting, we have a lot of drug concerns, but lots of sexual abuse allegations as well. Um, probably the biggest concern in our county is is and for, I mean, what is, for the Department of Trump Services purpose, what is a drug exposed child? So, the allegation varies based on the age of the child. So, drug exposed child is any child that has a parent who is using substances while they are caring for a child. That's going to be the exposure piece. And if the child is under the age of two, that's going to uh, be a more severe impact because of the nature of the, ch the child's age. Um, and then if the child is in utero, mother's using while pregnant, then that's going to be more of a severe abuse allegation on, on the front end because you've got a, an infant that's exposed to substance abuse, um, oftentimes going to be diagnosed uh, with NAS, may not be diagnosed considering what type of substance the mother um, is using, like if it's mess, the child won't be diagnosed with NAS because it's which is neonatal abstinence system, which, because meth a lot of times doesn't have withdrawal. Uh, but we do see a lot of that. Probably the most common substance that we see right now is be fentanyl, um, with the second most common currently, I would say, going back and forth between meth and cocaine, but meth is kind of going on the back burner, and you're going to see a lot more of fentanyl and cocaine right now. Yeah, I found that to be true. Lots of and ecstasy is also coming to come back, which is odd to me. Is there a place in here where it's uh, geographically identified certain sections of the county or anything where it's most? Likely? It's hard for us to geographically identify based on pulling our data. I can do it, um, and I can ask our the guy who pulled the data for me to see if he can break it down. Um, I would say it's really there's no respective. There are specific there are specific areas that have a more like a higher rate of a certain drug, but not a higher rate of drugs in general. So like in, in Westmoreland, you're going to see a little bit more meth use there. Um, other than that, it's pretty much countywide. How about reports of sexual abuse? Countywide. No geographical where it might be. 
of the folks present. Yeah, county wide. You said something. You said cocaine was kind of coming to the forefront. Meth was taking a backseat or decreasing somewhat. That's that, 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 that's interesting because cocaine is a more expensive drug. I think not that I buy it or anything, but it's more expensive. Uh, meth is used because of its affordability. I wonder if cocaine is becoming more affordable because they're cutting it with fentanyl, and you're seeing that, yes. and it's coming to the forefront as a result of them cutting it with fentanyl. We all know how dangerous that is. Absolutely, everything has <coughs> fentanyl, and you don't really see a whole lot of labs now. So back, I've been with the department for 11 years. When I first started, there was a lot more labs, especially the shake and bake, like back seat type labs. And you just don't see that now because the risk versus reward is not there. Um, and so people that are using math are usually going to get it from a super lab in Mexico where it's being transferred over here. Um, it's cheaper for everybody um, to use fentanyl, and so they're cutting things with fentanyl. We have a lot of people just use straight fentanyl, which four years ago it was not seen. Now, we have plenty of parents that will say, I use fentanyl every day. And they know that they're using fentanyl. Um, yes, while what pregnant. What did you say? While pregnant. pregnant. We've also had, like I said, cocaine is just coming back on the forefront. And they'll, they'll say, um, I'm using an eight ball bottle of cocaine a day, which is absurd. Like, it's just not what we have been hearing. It's been probably four or five years ago, you would have heard heroin. Um, but what we just kind of see is, different substances kind of make it around and you'll see a, um, an uptake of one certain drug for a while and then that might go away. But with fentanyl, it, it definitely makes things a little bit more complicated. Uh, the overdoses, the people think that they're using one drug and it's not, or they think that they um, got just THC and there's something in that, so we see a lot of different upticks. Yeah, we, we see that on a pretty regular basis and it's hard because you, there are some parents that I have literally believe when they're like, I, I thought I was doing cocaine, or I thought I was doing weed, there's something else in it, and, and I have many times just friend, I'm like, that makes sense, well, you're not, you know, you're buying illegal drugs off the street, so you don't know what you've got, and, right, so it, it's just a, it's a sad situation because those are the cases, the, the drug exposure cases really drive to the courthouse um, for petitions and removals and, and those kind of things because we face the same thing with kids who go into markets and buy the THC and things like that which is the THC the product with THC and it's non-regulated so they may think they're buying a drug with a certain level which is legal for an adult but it's actually because it's unregulated there could be oh, yeah. way more than they anticipate and we're, we're seeing the effects of that on students who are buying what they think is a harmless. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we, we uh, I, I spoke with the drug task force not long ago, and they're and it's it's a constant struggle for them because they're doing these checks on places that are and, and the levels are being advertised as Delta oh, oh yeah they're Delta, yeah they're low, and then you start doing the testing on them, and they're well beyond yeah. what the acceptable amounts are. And right. You're you're exactly right. Then you've got kids. Who it's wholly illegal to be in possession of at all, and then they're, I mean, you know, they're all over the school and have the, the vape related kind of cases that we deal with in juvenile court tend to be THC vapes that somebody got from somebody else, and they say that I, I didn't know anything about it. I sit on the disciplinary committee for the county, and uh, we ask kids, and those that will talk will tell you, oh, yeah, you, know, you can buy it at this market, mm -hmm. this market, that market. 15, 16 year old kids. Yeah. And, and, and the thing is, is that the law is not really keeping up with that. I mean, the, the, the legal world tends to react pretty slowly. Mm -hmm. What we see on the front end still takes the better part of a year or two to even hit the legislature because of the way the session goes. So it looks like that we're constantly running behind, and in many respects, we are. Uh, because of the legislative process, it is, is, is moves uh, in the session that it does. Um, so the drug has changed by the time you get around to the right. Yeah, yeah. What's like vapes? All of a sudden, THC vapes exploded within the last couple of years, and the law is like still looking at it, going, "Well, but it, but 
it really only applies, you know, it's, it's, like, it's marijuana, and that's bad, and well, tobacco, that's bad, but it's, there's very little things that you can do, so there, there's been sort of a push to try to find a way to get in uh, to address vape and particular stuff for amongst kids. A lot of these CBD products are marketed toward children. Um, if you go to a store, like I was at Gates a couple of weeks ago, and at the register is all these gummies. And they look like just candy. Uh, but they're CBD products, and they shouldn't be in the hands of a child, but they look like children. Uh, so what we see a lot on our end is we have at least one, if not more, but at least one case a month where a young child has gotten into CBD products and have gone, had to go to the hospital because they're eating what they think is candy that mom and dad had just accidentally left out or not put in a proper place to store. And now we've got a young child who... Um, and really the, the biggest factor is they're sleeping significantly longer and they're very lethargic. Um, but these, because they mark them towards kids, it's just really unsafe for the young kids because they look like candy. We confiscated a package. It looked like a round packet, like you would get Altoids or something like that. And, and it was sour patch, small, gummy worms. And on the back it says manufactured and sold in California. So the kids were going online, buying a product at the time that was legal in California but illegal here. They were shipping it, and then a kid was making that purchase for seven, eight, ten dollars, and he was selling them. I mean, he was a little entrepreneur. He was selling them for twenty and twenty-five dollars a package, and it looked like kids' candy. Yeah. All right. Uh, one thing also that we have attached on here is data that we have collected uh, for a year to date um, for, you know, and we have, I mean, it's, it's some extensive kind of stuff because we talk about the kinds of cases that we're seeing. Now, our program for juvenile courts for our case management is called Quest, and Quest is capable of generating a lot of reports. One of the things that juvenile courts are required to do is turn over statistics on a very frequent basis to the state of Tennessee so that that way they're compiling these issues and seeing what not just the Sumner County Juvenile Court is seeing, but what everybody else is seeing. And that there is a concentrated effort right now to try to have more communication between courts because even though we all I think we all, most of the courts have the same case management system now because it's pretty useful. I mean, it will pretty much do everything but your taxes, and I'm not mm -hmm. convinced it wouldn't do that. If you know where to put it. Um, there's still communication between courts themselves. It's still, I'm still requiring staff to call Robertson County or call Robertson County or whatever to try to get information. But a long way around to say, these, the information that you're seeing, and it's multiple pages. We, we ran uh, as much as we could go, um, about 17 pages of data from juvenile court. I'm going to let Alan talk about that because until just very recently, when he got prom uh, promoted to magistrate, he was the, the legal services director over at juvenile. Um, and uh, he was our legal services director until June when he was appointed, when after Master Begley resigned, and so we appointed Allen. So part of his prior responsibilities was managing some of the data flow that we have. So I'm going to let Allen talk about the data that we're seeing um, that are to be found sort of pages 1 to 17. Yeah, I'll just come up here and make this easier. Just to make this go faster, so you all turn to page 5, just as a, as a data submitted by the county, or by the juvenile court. That's page five and five, we'll be able to see that, how it's marked. Um, on page five, if you look specifically at the file of statutes, this just shows uh, new uh, cases basically that are brought or um, any time that any one of these, especially if you look under that in the felony delinquency matters, uh, how many times that uh, one of these uh, charges has been brought before the juvenile court. Just some of the interesting ones based on kind of our discussion today specifically. If you look down, you can see some numbers. I mean, it's interesting. We have, uh, you can look at aggravated assaults just for the calendar year of January. This is the far right side. January of this year to August 19th. You have 11 aggravated assault cases, 63 burglaries, 
for, and sometimes these are multi-count cases, but again, these are for different counts, as many times as that file statute has been filed. If you turn over, there's only one, uh, if you look at rape, one rape case, um, you can look at the possession of firearm case, and that's felony level, is it two? Uh, again, these are felony level drug charges, if you're looking at the schedule one, two, uh, six as well. Uh, all of these are felony level cases, and that's why you see that the numbers are so low, because we'll go to misdemeanors in a second. I um, just want you to be aware of the kind of difference there. And then you've got that to the 15. Um, our felony level issues, especially if we're looking at rape, uh, especially if we're looking at any sexual crimes, you have sexual battery there as well, which is at three. Our felony level issues are lower level. So when you come down to misdemeanor level crime, specifically, the numbers get a little bit higher, especially when you're looking at, um, you look at, um, I mean, assaults are at 46, that's general. Uh, if you look at domestic assault, which is something we see quite frequently, uh, looking at violent crimes. Um, you can also look at uh, kind of our uh, other issues, failure to appear as well. You flip over to the other pages where you get into handgun possession cases, and then you'll get into possession of uh, drug paraphernalia and also simple possession. Mm -hmm. If you jump down to simple possession or casual exchange, there are 79 cases or cases <coughs> follow statutes that are brought just uh, pending this year. So simple uh, possession, casual exchange, that's usually just after the marijuana, but the thing that we're seeing is many times this marijuana is usually laced with fentanyl or other drugs. Um, simple possession can also be used for other uh, types of drugs depending on the amount, so it can be broad. Um, so we have 79 uh, times that that file statute has been filed in our court since the beginning of January. And if we go back further, we'll be able to see that is one of the highest number of them. That is one of the most frequent crimes that we see coming through for juveniles. Some other interesting ones that um, I think uh, we should take note of is you look at threat of mass violence as well. And this, obviously, if you look back on the felony level, there has only been one reported, and that is because of a law change recently that took effect on July 1. Uh, with the threats of mass violence as well, the school property, if you look at it for the misdemeanor version of the crime, we have 16. And this is something that we're seeing more and more of as time goes on. Uh, we've had more uh, reported uh, charges of, of threat of mass violence and misdemeanor. And we'll see how the felony crime that has been updated, none of the part of our legislative update, what that looks like. Based on all of this data, looking at it together, a lot of our issues are substance abuse related. That's the majority of what we're seeing. Okay? And a lot of that also has to do with mental health. Um, that we're seeing on the back end of that with a lot of these crimes. A lot of these kids that we're seeing are self-medicating, uh, and a lot of that comes through the testimony when these kids come to court. Um, Most of the theft, money, possession, all that related to purchasing drugs. Uh, it can be drugs, it can be shoplifting, it can be... A lot of shoplifting. A lot of shoplifting. We deal with a lot of just a, a, a random shoplifting kind of stuff, and then there's a statutory change this year to address really what I like to think of as sort of retail conspiracy theft, where you have multiple actors in a larger uh, sort of process of, of evidence. Oh, well. Yeah, where where there is there is an obvious connection between multiple thefts and how it's running. So that's sort of a, a much more organized retail theft that we're beginning to start seeing in Tennessee. And they sell that to get drugs, or they just I sell it to go on a trip or whatever? I think it's whatever they can do with it. Really? Yeah. I see, I see a lot of kids pulling on door handles and stuff, too. And I think sometimes those yeah. are classified as auto burglary, sometimes they're classified as theft. But that's bad. been, yeah. that's okay. like a, at least half my clients in juvenile court are kids will go through apartment complexes pulling on door handles. And a lot of those cases also are multi-count cases. So a lot of these with the file statutes, it could be one case that has six or seven of these file statutes attached to it from one end. This just gives how many times this type of crime is committed. And that's why I like using these data as I mean, uh, these statistics because it just shows you how many times there are allegations that each of these types of crimes have happened in our county. And just going back to there were something that we were talking about about the vaping, and if you go to page eight, at the top of the page, uh, there are, these are specifically 
where it starts with illegal use of telecommunication device, runaway, unruly, and then you're going to see youth tobacco, which is youth possessed of tobacco, smoking hemp or vapor products. These are all considered status offenses. So, and the, and the tobacco one is a little bit weird because it also, in some respects, applies to adults, but in other respects, it only applies to kids. Um, but everything else here is based solely upon age. So, you know, for example, uh, Becca can't be charged with runaway because she's an adult, uh, but a child can. So, also, when you're looking at these kind of cases and the numbers over there, for our youth tobacco cases, that tops out on the status or unruly offenses because that's one of the things that we see. Most of the stuff I see out at the school is assault, disorderly conduct, or possession of vape skill, which is usually THC. Because I've had the officers who are like, we're not really charging a lot when it's just tobacco based because we're hand they're able to handle it in the school. It's really when we see the THC stuff popping up. So to me, this is an it. The, the vape issue is a big issue because it goes into sort of everything else. So, just, so as you as you look through that, you'll sort of see it's all broken down into columns and the kind of things. As you turn over towards page 11, you will see sort of dispositions of what the kinds of things that we are doing in court for such things as probation, whether you're dealing with issues of what programs that we have. For example, about quarter of the, three quarters of the way down on the page, you'll see a program that says Insight Program. Insight is a drug and alcohol uh, education program that we do at the juvenile court. One of our, one of my staff teaches that class. It's a multi-week class. So for alcohol and drug related issues, a lot of kids go to that. We also have online classes, and those became honestly pretty popular during COVID. Um, and my assistant at the time, she went through and we, she searched out a, a sort of blanket company that provided multiple ideas. And then she went through to determine whether or not some of the classes are offered for things that we might think of as worthwhile. It's one thing to go, well, I'm going to send you to a theft intervention class, but unless we're going to gain something from it and in order to try to keep kids from gaming the system as well. And we did catch some not long ago because they were being ordered to do the class, but then they were skipping the sort of test at the end because they weren't required them to do it. They just were doing the class, so we're like, no, 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 you got to do the, the full, if you're going to do the thing, you got to go all the way. So we have seen a lot of success in the online classes. Now, some of my colleagues across the state have not liked these as well as sort of we have, but when you're dealing with folks, when, with, with COVID when it started, we had to do something. And then also when you're dealing with a lot of people who are just, you know, it may be very problematic for a parent to have to take off work to take their child to somewhere to have this class done. That's even if you could find it within Sumner County. So we were have been sort of our hands tied geographically because we may not have something that, you know, Metro has or another county has, and then trying to find these things is often difficult. Or it comes down to money where you're organized, we're requesting somebody to do something and they can come back and said, you know, we looked into this, but it was going to cost us, you know, a couple hundred dollars. And most folks are, I mean, they're more struggling with paying a couple hundred bucks. So. What kind of handle do you have on the child and you send him to inside? What controls do you have to make sure he does it? Well, if he did do it, what happens? Then they come back to court again. So, for a lot of these kids, it is a way they're able to keep their driver's license. Okay. okay. So, if they don't complete it, then their license can be revoked okay. uh, for a minimum of a year. Um, and that's for a first offender. But for most, though, it is the fact that you don't want to come back to court again to find out that your license going to be revoked, or you wind up, you went in not on probation, but suddenly now you come out of the courtroom, now you're on probation, and there's the whole gamut that they go to that too. 
Yeah, there's incentives. Most incentives we have found, good, bad, or ugly, is pain. Most people get to learn by pain. Um, and I hate to put it that way, but it's, yeah. it's, I, I can't have, can't tell you I've ever said that from the bench. So, yeah. so I would just encourage you to to look through these um, and just this way, it's not going to give you the day-to-day -day of what juvenile court looks like, but it's going to give you a good idea of the things that we're seeing on a very regular basis, which may then help guide our later conversations on the things that we think may be really important. To me, we want sort of low-hanging fruit. I think the issue about vaping and that kind of thing is something that we could be concerned about because there is a growing push among some of my colleagues that the, stat, the current statute should be changed to clear some things up and make it far more punitive than it really is right now. So much of juvenile law, good, bad, or ugly, is not, is not designed as a punitive measure, and, and I understand that. It's designed as an educational and rehabilitative measure, but community safety is part of that process as well. That's well defined in the statute about the court. So it's it's a constant balancing act about making sure that you're not, you know, dropping a hammer on some kid for something versus making sure that their behavior is corrected and giving them an opportunity to make positive changes in their life. Thank you on the part of the child or the community. Or both. I think both. Um, now, one of the last times that we were here, um, I know that Mr. Sittler had, had introduced the notion, I know, because I remembered it and we got into the minutes, is so that we're not in our conversations looking at reinventing the wheel, but what are other places doing? I think that I'm about to go to my judicial conference for this year and start having some conversations with some others about what other counties are doing. A couple of the ones that are surrounding counties uh, that their judges and I are, are, friend, are very friendly, I'm getting an idea of sort of what they do. Some of them have a much greater budget than the Cuba Court here um, or in much smaller counties, but it's, it's always a good thing to find out what anybody else is looking at. One of the ways in which doing this is something that's called a sequential intercept model. I'm going to let Alan talk about that because it's a good way of mapping the question I think we asked a little while ago about parts of the county or parts of the community, and I think the, the intercept model may be a good way of helping map some of that. So I know in between the statistics that we have from Juvenile Court, there are a few different reports that you'll see also from Kansas Session. I just want to mention those. There's some interesting data. What we're required to do when a child is found delinquent, the court is required by statute to have a child do a needs and risk assessment. Um, those needs and risk assessments are compiled, and there are certain data points that are, I think, are important based off of what is deemed actionable or where the court needs to take action to provide certainty. I just pulled one of the reports. I was looking at the October 1st through September 30th report. There's some interesting uh, things and insights here about what is actionable usually that we deal with most of these kids. If you look at this one, the highest things, at least for, uh, again, these did not get numbered as well. But if you're looking at the October 1st, 2022, through the September 30th, 2023, and this is report. the report that looks like it's the JJ Cans. Mm -hmm. and, uh, there are different dates, there are different times for that done before. I'm looking at one specifically that says October 1st uh, through September 30th, 2022. So October 1, 2022. If you split, over from that, there are definitely different issues that are kind of the play. If you go from the first page of that, it gives another of many assessments. We've got 240 assessments. There's a referral type and some basic demographic information about what we're dealing with. What I find most interesting is when you get to youth risk behaviors uh, as part of that, and then also the behavior, emotional needs, and genome justice and traumatic experiences. This gives some interesting data. Obviously, there's academic issues that are mentioned on the youth risk behaviors, maybe 20%, or one of the issues where that is an issue, where you have children that are not uh, able to, or not showing any academic progress or success. Um, and then there are other uh, risks that are uh, looking at that. Family risk issue seems to be the highest. And that comes into play, especially when we're looking at exposure to abuse and things like that. Uh, there are other actual items. But based on what the 
purview of the NIST Ad Hoc Committee, if you flip to the next page, where you're looking at behavior, emotional needs, uh, juvenile justice, and traumatic experiences, kind of uh, outlay of different percentages of what's the actual. One of the highest at the first for youth behavioral, emotional needs, and mental health. That is the highest percentage where there's actual harms related to children of those 240 that went through the assessment. As for juvenile justice issues, the seriousness of the offense as well. Um, that is a high percentage of where we have to take action. Uh, and a lot of times that is deemed on the nature of the offense. But also, if you look at traumatic experiences for most of these kids, look at what you're seeing. 67.9% of the 240 have experienced grief um, within a certain time period of committing the offense. Could they've been witnesses or victims or seen community or school violence? 58% of the 240 have witnessed that to some degree. Um, disruptions in caregiving, 37% of the kids here, 37.5% have had some disruption. Whether that they've been passed in as a caregiver, maybe the Department of Children Services has been involved. 36% of victims have witnessed criminal activity in their life. 30.8% experience family violence. 25.8% experience emotional abuse. 16.3% um, experience sexual abuse. 15.8% experience physical abuse. And 11.7% experience some form of neglect. We find that these experiences, also based on the type of crime and also the mental health issues that are involved, substance abuse, is lower in this pool, but also seems to the issue. The traumatic experiences and other adverse child experiences usually are all tells all signs of when a child will engage in criminal behavior. So I just want to point that out as you're looking through each of those. Those are different segments where we, again, are required to do those CAMS assessments. Each report is a different time frame. This is the longest and the broad size. So I just chose that as kind of um, an indication of what this report would tell you. Um, and again, we, we do these uh, assessments on any child that is found to be delinquent through our courts. So all of them can do this if they are adjudicated delinquent. Now, uh, going back to this point, I'll skip past the other those, those others of those reports and go past to simply uh, looking at the intercept model. Now, the so sequential intercept model, or SIM, I'm just, again, this is a brief overview of you. I just want to print this. These are the last few pages of the packet. This just gives a, an overview of what this model has been used for. This model has been used to map um, basically where there are intersections for mental health needs and substance abuse issues with the court system specifically. And using this model, many, many different courts and different community uh, agencies have used this to map where individuals uh, or youth we use this when we were trying to form our juvenile mental health court and trying to determine where there were. Uh, touch points for children with mental health issues to see where we could get the best service for them for the court that we were trying to create. Uh, we're trying to create a way, especially a format of trying to figure out what do we have in our community, what does this youth problem look like since it's so vast. We look at mental health issues, we look at the types of violence that uh, children experience, what they're exposed to, we're looking at substance abuse issues and how that ties to all of this. We're trying to map where they are touch points for children depending on what age group we're looking at, but I mean, if we're looking at elementary school, middle school, and high school age kids, we can map different areas. And again, this goes through, you'll see that there are different points. There's a diagram here, we're talking about intercept zero, talking about community resources, crisis lines, et cetera. Intercept one talks about law enforcement. Uh, and then this goes through criminal justice funding, but this can be expanded also for looking at other community resources, like the schools. We talk about school counselors, we talk about teachers, we talk about all of that. Where are these uh, issues being manifesting themselves? And looking at this model as kind of a framework for us to, to come to a better understanding of what is going on in our community, this is where trying to get these community partners to come and maybe present and help us get a better understanding. That would allow us to make a map of this, these are the issues that we see, especially when we're looking at mental health issues as related to uh, either uh, sexual expression and inappropriately and the of sexual behaviors or we're having uh, sexual issues with parents and either exposing their children to issues 
this is just a framework to try and map all of this. Uh, it's a very, very large undertaking, uh, and it takes time. But in doing that, it allows us to see where do we have gaps in the resources, number one. Uh, and these can be resources not to name one churches as well, because we have individuals coming to pastors' reverence to disclose information, uh, through counseling, trying to map all of this time. There, it's a very difficult thing to do unless we can come up with some system to do that. And this is a model that's been used to do that effectively for other court systems and community organizations. And I just want to present it as an option. I know uh, Mr. Settler had said we should not reinvent at the wheel. My thing is I don't know how many have done what we're trying to do using this model. I know this model has been used for different organizations to accomplish similar, uh, similar things. Um, but for our setting uh, in this ad hoc committee, it was just an idea to help formulate a plan of action moving forward where we might be able to try and address kind of the monumental issues that we do and maybe make them where they're easily uh, ascertainable and understandable based on, on the map. So I just provide that. And Judge Howard you knows we've been through this process before with our Institute on Health Board. This is what we did uh, to get it started. And it took time. And then COVID hit us and it took more time. So that's a sequential understanding. And, and ultimately, uh, it, it's not a it's not a call for members of this committee to start map, to start mapping things out. It, it is a possibility that, that something that we might be able to recommend to the county commission as as something that could be needed going forward, so that we understand our community even better. Uh, the last thing that I wanted to talk about tonight was just sort of a just very quick legislative update. Threat of mass violence statute, which is uh, Tennessee Code Annotated 39-16-517, is particularly the threat of mass violence on school property for a school-related activity. This statute has made some had some changes. Uh, one of them is it is now a felony, an e felony, and that applies to a to a juvenile as well. Now, in juvenile court, we don't really think in terms of felonies or misdemeanors until we do which is a goofy way of saying they don't really matter until they matter. And when we're dealing with how to how to look at things in a more serious nature versus not. So sure. an, e, an E class felony is the lowest felony level. So I used to could break out and I'm sure Logan can probably help break out. It's a one to two, it's usually at a turn. Yeah, about one to three. So so if for example that Mr. Duffer decides that he wants to go out and commit a felony, that's an E felony tonight, then he could be charged with that and his sentence range is one to three years. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean it's like going to prison, but it's just what the range of his sentence is. It's a low Yes. For a juvenile, it doesn't really matter quite as much, but I think it was nice that the legislature acknowledged that these cases are on the rise. We see a lot of these, and the juveniles themselves are getting younger. So it's not the 16-year-old who is really talking about doing something. Now we're seeing the 12-year-old, the 10-year-old. Yes. Yeah. That was PCA what? It's a 39, 16, 5, 17. Now, one of the things that can be done in these cases is that Statutorily, the court can order and the state pay for an evaluation of the child in question. Now, part of that is based upon your fact pattern. What does your facts look like? And so many of the things that we're seeing is they're just random statements. And I think probably our 11 year old, I mean, it's statements that might be construed as a joke, but nobody can take it. And I'm not saying that facetiously. I'm just simply saying that's where we are. So under certain circumstances, if somebody is demonstrating that they might have a desire, not I want to shoot Logan, but if, they, if they're demonstrating that they may have the, the means and the agenda to do so, an evaluation can be ordered and paid for by the state. A better understanding of this kid moving ahead. Now, one of the things that 
my board and my office is about to do is that we have a meeting with the district attorney and we have a meeting with a representative of the State Department of Homeland Security. Every jurisdiction has a Homeland Security agent assigned to it. So Summer County has a, an agent assigned in early September. We had hoped to have the meeting prior to September the 6th, but it wasn't capable to be done. So we are having a meeting with the district attorney, with folks in my office, Sheriff's Department and uh, with the agent from the Department of Homeland Security to sort of discuss what the response is going to be now that the statute has changed. Because some jurisdictions, and I have a memo that has been issued out of Davidson County that Judge Calloway shared with me, I think is worthwhile in addressing both parents and children and the community as a whole to show that these kind of things are taken seriously. Right now in my court, if you have, are charged with a threat of mass violence, unless that case is dismissed by the DA for some reason, that kid is going to be placed on probation. They're going to be under supervised probation in the court so that we have a hand on what's going on. At, at, at minimum. At minimum. Um, we are looking at, and I don't want to talk too much out of school because uh, I have sort of what I would like to see and obviously trying to facilitate that with everybody else is always a, 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 an interesting thing. But one thing that we're looking at doing is detain about detention on the front end for a child who's charged with this so that we can get the assessment done fast or we'll try to get it done quicker that we can get potential non-supervision even a kid who's been released from detention would be on some degree of bond supervision even before they come to court. Because these are the things that, frankly, that keep me up at night because the last thing you want to do is you want to join a situation in the club of where kids are shooting kids in school. And there are many that I think probably have nothing more than they're just running their mouth, but I've seen that I have had serious concerns yeah, about. Yeah, uh, due to warn, the law statute has been updated too for our counselors. They have to report them you know, much more free, frequently conversations of mass violence against any group or anything. It's, it's to really ramp up. The due to warn has changed. So I wanted y'all to know that this is something that certainly is, is weighs pretty heavily on my mind because of the fact that we're seeing more of these cases and the fact that the juveniles charged in these cases are growing younger. Um, and also, to let you know that we are having this meeting on September the 6th, and that by the time that we come back and reconvene again, I will be able to report to you what that meeting has looked like and then what I think that um, what my court will be doing and hopefully be able to bring you copies of the memorandum that we're planning to that's with the DA and the that gentleman with Homeland Security. Yes. And right, that his name is uh, Special Agent Scott Greenwood. And I, I would assume that we're going to meet with the uh, over that the lieutenant over the SROs as well, because the school resource officers, God bless them, because they are in deep on these cases, and we're they're and policy wise, when there's yeah. ever a potential. Threat of mass violence, does this or other usually tasked with doing a sweeping up <coughs> every time? Yeah. To ensure the child does not have a, a way to meet it completely that threat is being made. So, do you know if there's a representative within the school system? Uh, the SROs are within, but they're not the school system. Is there a representative with the school system that's going to be a part of that meeting? Or? I don't know, but I would welcome somebody to come and be part of that meeting. I can speak with Dr. Langford. Uh, I'm, I'm willing. If somebody wants to come and take the initiative, I don't want to throw you under the bus. Uh, and certainly don't want to get you in trouble with your bosses. So, uh, But I'd be happy to reach out and have somebody there because ultimately that's a conversation we need to have with school principals and school officials yeah. as well so that we're all on the same page on this. She, she might be a good representative. Okay. Yeah. All right. But yeah, I, I would I would love to hear the conversation sure. and how that okay. developed. Yeah, I'll let y'all know what that looks like when we can meet again.
that's sort of all I've got. I know there's a we have a lot of data and a lot of I hate to say the fact of talking at you tonight, but um, just wanted y'all to be aware of sort of what's going on so that after our next meeting we can start really maybe focusing in on the areas that really we want to address um, and then uh, figure out sort of what our timetable is uh, because I'm sure that y'all do not want to be drugged out here for a year. Uh, so if we can start figuring out what our timetable is and what, what that wants to look like. So, I, But I certainly I appreciate everybody coming as well because it's important and the very fact that you're wanting to be here means that you're wanting to be here to help our children and families and we need to do everything we can as we use this community to do that. So what you're saying is almost like being behind, the state being behind. Um, as soon as you create a plan, you need to change and have created a new plan. So part of, part of, we don't do anything in human court without talking it for a while and try to come up with a plan, but we also want to be looking down the road getting an idea of what's coming so that way we can make those adjustments. Right. Your, your all's involvement helps make that happen. So that's all I have this evening. I don't know if anybody else have anything that they want to mention at this juncture. All right. We have a motion to entertain to adjourn. Second. 